Temple Karate Hall of Fame. My name is Paul Casey. This is an educational video series where we have a chance to talk with the members of the Hall of Fame. I call them the gold standard, chosen by their peers and earn the respect to be a part of a certain body, a group of people, both men and women, with their contributions as competitors, instructors, and ambassadors of Kempo. With no further ado, we'd like to thank and welcome the Master of the Arts, Mr. Tommy Burks from Texas. Tommy, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, sir. Thank you for inviting me to come on. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And so now we're gonna start with, uh, if I can, I'm gonna ask you some questions. If you don't mind, let me get it going here. Tommy, tell us about the history of you. Why did you go into Kempo? Actually, I started uh, in 1963. I trained for about six months in judo with a brown belt that I was working with. And, uh, you know, to me, that just really wasn't, you know, it was an interesting art, but it wasn't what I was interested in. So in 1966, on June 15th, two things happened that day. My son was born that morning. And uh, at the time, you could go in and, and see your wife for about 15 or 20 minutes before they kicked you out of the hospital. You got to see the baby for about five minutes through the window, and then they kicked you out. So I went up there that afternoon and seen my wife and my son. And then I'd seen an ad in the local newspaper uh, about a Taekwondo class. Well, I always wanted to study karate. So I went out to the National Guard Armory in Denton, Texas, and walked in and signed up for Taekwondo classes. That class was taught by Mike Steen, Alan Steen's little brother. And uh, I got introduced real quick to what a term they had in uh, Texas at that time called light contact, which was one inch penetration to the face three inch penetration to the body without gear on. So, you know, and I, you know, luckily I was very fortunate. They let me go ahead and fight five fights that first night that I was there. And they were all against brown belts. We probably had 11 brown belts in that class. And I, I come out of there looking like I'd been in a car wreck. And I'm driving home and I'm thinking, man, this is great. And so I get up the next morning and I go see my ex-wife now. And she thought I'd been in a car wreck. And I actually stopped at a convenience store on my way home. And I walked in and the guy looks up and behind the counter and he goes, wow, do I need to call you an ambulance? And I said, for what? He said, you wasn't in a car wreck? And I said, no. He said, what happened to you? I said, man, I paid for this. And so he was kind of anxious to get me out of the store. But um, again, you know, I got, I had a couple of setbacks when I was in Taekwondo with uh, a couple of severe back injuries. One of them was a sciatic nerve problem. And uh, during that time, I got over into Kung Fu for about six months since I couldn't kick with that sciatic nerve problem and realized that wasn't what I was looking for. And I got back into Taekwondo and then uh, eventually made black belt under a guy named Larry Castor who was considered the toughest guy that had ever got in the uh, Alan Steen regime. And, you know, I got to train with some very talented people like Skipper Mullins and Roy Kerbin, Max Ossip, uh, Demetrius Havanis, uh, Ray McCallum, Joy Turberville, and uh, a lot of other top-notch people. But it wasn't really what I was looking for. Uh, I, I was, you know, to me, Taekwondo was too oriented to tournament fighting. And I, I don't know, I just, I just really wasn't interested in tournaments. I was looking for self-defense. And so, you know, I eventually got over into uh, the Okinawan system. Because I always heard, man, if you really want to learn karate, get you a Japanese instructor. And so I got into that. There was a class in the town I lived in. And I went in there and, I, you know, I met the instructor. And... Uh, he goes, well, since you're a black belt in another system, you have to stay a white belt until you're ready to test for black. And I said, well, I don't really have a problem with that. And so 17 months later, <clears throat> he tested me for black belt and promoted me straight to second black. But when I got into the Okinawan system, I started asking, well, why do we do this? And uh, I remember, I don't remember which kata it was, 
but we, we had the same motion that we got in short two, where we step off to nine o'clock and we, we do a left vertical block with a right punch. I said, why did we do this? And he looked at me with a strange look on his face and he goes, well, uh, you're not at a level I can explain it to you. And I'm going, okay. So at the, when I got promoted to second black, I went back and asked him that again. Same answer. And I knew he didn't have a clue, you know, why we did that. And so, uh, again, it, it really wasn't what I was looking for. And uh, so, you know, at the time I was working in uh, Arlington, Texas, and one of the engineers came in one day and, and he worked out at a fitness center about two blocks from our office. And he said, hey, he said, uh, what's Kempo Karate? And I said, well, you know, if it's Ed Parker's Kempo Karate, it's, you know, it's a very, you know, tough uh, self-defense system. He said, well, there's a guy teaching that over at the fitness center. <clears throat> so I went by and, you know, I, I talked to the guy that was running the class and I decided, well, I'd try this out and see if that's what I was looking for. And, you know, I went on, I believe it was, it was teaching on Mondays and Wednesdays, or it might've been Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I went to one class and uh, I left there fairly disappointed. And so I thought, well, you know, I paid for a month. I'll go back and see if it's, this gets any better. Well, the second uh, class, a guy named Jeff Dukes, who I'll always be internally grateful to, he was a second degree, had came into Arlington out of Phoenix, Arizona. And for some reason or another, you know, Mr. Dukes took a liking to me and come over and, and uh, spent a, that entire class uh, just working with me. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, um, this class is not going to be a good fit for you. He said, why don't you let me get you hooked up directly with Mr. Parker as a uh, club and you do your own thing. And if I can help you in any way I can help you, I'll be more than happy to do so. So, you know, I actually worked out uh, probably three, three or four, maybe four times with uh, Jeff Dukes. And then he, he moved out of that area and but he had got me set up with Mr. Parker as a club. So on May 1st, 1986, I became a club member with the IKKA. Now I was told I had one year to, uh, I was given a provisional first degree black belt certificate. And I was told I had one year to get ready and test for first black. So, you know, only thing I had was the old red manual, which I'm sure you're well aware of. And uh, the option to be a funny, I found mine was in the closet inside passing a school only because I asked Frank, what's in that closet? He said, <laughs> I don't know. Why don't you look? So I went in and broke into Mr. Parker's desk. Sorry, Mr. Parker. And I got all the keys and I found the original typed manuscripts for uh, for the Red Book. Sadly, that and everything else was destroyed in Pasadena during the fire in uh, the late 80s. Well, when I got into Kempo, I immediately realized uh, this is what I'd been looking for for 20 years. And um, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I've got to get ready to test uh, for Black Belt in one year. So I started training two to three hours a day, six and generally seven days a week, I would make uh, audio tapes calling out the names of the techniques. Uh, back in, they had the little small cassettes that you could plug into your radio. And I would listen to those tapes driving back and forth to work because it took me an hour and 45 minutes to get to work. And uh, I would run through techniques, uh, et cetera, you know, all the way to work and all the way back home. It's a wonder I didn't wind up getting in an accident or something from not paying attention. You know, my wife used to scream at me all the time because we'd be driving down the highway and I start doing techniques in the air and let go of the wheel. She's screaming at me to, you know, get back a hold of the wheel. But uh, so exactly, and you know, I was very fortunate because during that year, 
uh, Mr. Planis was coming in to Irving. A guy named Rick Fowler was bringing Mr. Planis into Irving for seminars. And uh, so I started going to his seminars and Mr. Planis would always talk about concepts and principles. And so, you know, and he, he would do something that always kind of showcased concepts and principles on something like that. So I would leave there and then when I, you know, the next day when I got home, I would start going through every technique that uh, I'd worked out and uh, seeing if I could apply what he demonstrated during his seminar to the techniques that I was working on. And so that gave me a, a better taste of uh, what Mr. Parker talked about is why you do what you do. And I'm sure you've heard Mr. Parker, like I have, say numerous times, doing motion without not know, without knowing the reason why you do that motion is like speaking words that you don't know the definition of. So, like I say, the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. And uh, so. Did, let me ask you this, Tommy. When you were, during that period of that year, did you make any attempts to go and visit other, other Kempo instructors or to have some direction? Not, uh, no, I, re I, I really did not. Uh, I, I didn't feel like there was anybody in my area that I wanted to train with. But like I say, I got to see these people when I went to, seminars like Mr. LeBounty coming in and did a seminar six weeks after I joined uh, Kempo. And then Mr. Planis started coming in and stuff like this. And what I was seeing other instructors, students doing wasn't where I, what I, where I wanted to go to. Now, that was the unique thing about meeting Jeff Dukes. Uh, again, watching him move and do Kempo was like night and day watching the other people that I seen do Kempo. And I'm saying, I want to do that. So when you were there, with, when you were, you have a club or your school that you were, you know, given a provisional uh, uh, usage of, tell me, uh, did you have students under you that you were working with or it was just in you by yourself? Actually, when I, when I started going to seminars and I had, had other students asking me if they could train with me, which was a total shock to me, but I needed some bodies to work on. So, you know, that was great. Now, the old red manual, a lot of the material in that manual, especially when you got up in brown belt level, uh, which you probably recall, was extremely poorly written. And uh, so, what I would have to do is get a student to do the attack and I'd have to work out the proper angles to do that technique. And now in that period of one year by, again, I, I train a minimum of six days a week, two to three hours a day. Uh, I tested, you know, again, I got my club certificate on May 1st, 1986. It's hanging on my wall over here. And I tested on May 1st, 1987, exactly one year from the day I started. Did you use any other sources for your, uh, your education? Uh, again, at that time, I didn't, I didn't know of any other sources. I mean, did you ever reference things like uh, Mr. Parker's other writings? Like oh, yeah. When, when he, Mr. Parker started publishing his other stuff, I was buying everything I could get. I see. Did you, and what, what were some of the some of the publications that you used? Well, when the Infinite Insights, you know, started hitting the uh, scene and stuff like that, I was buying those. I bought, you know, I got his deal on women's uh, self-defense. Uh, you know, the early Chinese Kempo book he put out, etc. Okay, uh, when you when you yeah. had these books and you were reviewing them, did you ever had uh, any dialogue with him? Did you ever talk to him about? any of the subject matter in the uh, in that part in a particular book I, I didn't talk to him about that I did talk to him once or twice that first year uh, but again they was very brief conversations and uh, then like I say on May 1st 1987 mm -hmm. I tested at Rick Fowler school with uh, probably five or six of his students there was a guy from Louisiana brought up his uh, wife to test 
there was a guy that had actually uh, named Dan Truex who had been in Mr. LeBounty's old system, the NCKKA, that had come over and, and asked if I would help him get ready to also test. Now, I never classified him as a student, but I helped him as much as I could. Where was Mr. Fowler's school? It was in Irving. So how far away is that from you? I know a little bit about Texas. Is this big uh, world? <laughs> where I was currently living when I first started, uh, it was probably about 40 miles. Okay. Now, one other person I did attend a class with uh, probably three times was, uh, and actually the first time I went over to that class was with Jeff Dukes, was a guy named David Sinaceris, who was a fifth degree under Mr. Kelly. Now that, and then like I say, the economy in Texas at that time had fell out of the bottom. And, uh, you know, after attending a couple of David's classes, he left and went to Boston. Now, one reference I had there, David had made a video uh, of him just walking through the techniques, forms, uh, et cetera, and was selling that to students. So I bought one of his videos and, you know, I would use that basically as a reference to reference what I was trying to work out in the manuals. I see. What about it? Like, uh, did you, uh, did, I'm guessing you looked at the infinite insights, which is what you talked about. you used as, as a reference. Do you yes. remember, do you understand what, what, the, what was the most important factors that you, you got from reading that publication? Well, you know, I think virtually all, everything that's in those, uh, books are important factors. Well, let's just start with volume one. Uh, obviously, it's mostly a more of a history lesson and an overview of Kempo. Can you give me any insight in there that was important to you that stood out? Well, you know, I was, I was very interested in Mr. Parker's history, et cetera, uh, how he came up. Actually, I'm, I'm in the point of learning more about that right now because uh, in 2015, I was asked to teach at a Kaji Kempo event in Fort Worth. Uh, it's the Richard Peralta group under uh, Imperato. And uh, started seeing the connections between Kaji Kempo and American Kempo. And, you know, I still, uh, I'm still connected to those guys. They made me an affiliate of their organization. Uh, and I'm actually trying to learn the more about the Kaji Kempo system right now. And uh, Mr. Burt Vickers in that degree in that group is also trying to learn more about the American Kempo system. Uh, you, you know, since you've been a par member of the Hall of Fame, you know that the vision uh, Mr. Parker had was to unite all martial arts and, there are, and the artists, as you know well. And uh, as a, it's a, it's, you know, in a perfect world, yes. And if you look at the, how, Tumetuous it is right now. We're seeing a lot of uh, discord in this world. It's very, very unsettling. However, uh, recently we've we've grown the Kempo family even more so that now we've incorporated not only American Kempo, which is what you're part of. We've got now the Tracy Kempo. We have that involved. We have Kaji Kempo. We have Lima Lama, Shaolin, Chinese, Guan Fa, and Hawaiian Kempo. And it's funny because all these systems basically originate or come from or via the islands of Hawaii. Right. And everyone I've met that has been associated with these other systems have been so gracious and, and, and thankful for Mr. Parker bringing Kempo to the mainland. So I would think you're at being a representative of the, of uh, the IKKA, you're going to be asked to do that. How's your feeling about exchanging uh, information uh, the system that you're aware of with these others? Oh, I think it's fantastic. I think that's what Mr. Parker wanted. And I think that's what we all should be doing. Okay. Uh, and, and again, I was very honored that the first time that I talked for, for this group of people, uh, they had a banquet that night and they totally shocked me because they called me up on the stage and presented me with a affiliation certificate to their group honoring my rank in their association that I held in the American Kempo. So oh, congratulations. Uh, you now have, how many students do you teach now? 
Basically, right now, I've got, oh, probably a half a dozen students. Okay, and what is the focus that you usually place in your, in your classes? The thing, the thing that I focus my students learning, um, now let, me, let me back up and show you why I'm going to say this. <clears throat> uh, in 88, uh, February 88, I called Mr. Parker because a, a black belt who trained, you know, we trained together in the Taekwondo system had came over in Kempo. Well, he had started with a couple of other people and then he came to me. Uh, you know, Mr. Parker taught a seminar the day after we tested for first at UT Dallas. Uh, and uh, this, this buddy of mine that was in Taekwondo with me, uh, when Mr. Parker, you know, showed us a technique to work on, I don't remember what the technique was, Mr. Parker said, all right, grab a partner. Well, Dickie Bowden come over and he got in front of me. And we started working out together. And we worked out a little bit. And he stepped back and he goes, wait a minute, what are you doing to me? I said, man, I'm just doing the technique. He goes, no, you're doing something different. And I said, no, I'm just doing the technique. And he said, well, I've been trying to keep you from doing that technique and I can't stop you from doing it. And I said, well, if you check out height width and depth, people can't counter what you're doing. And so he, he jumped up and he goes, can I start training with you? Okay, so, you know, we, I got him up through, and Mr. Parker had, uh, the night that we tested, uh, I don't know if you ever met uh, Mr. Keith C or not. Uh, no, Mr. He, was a, he was a six degree in Kaji, but he had also came over to American Kempo. Mr. Parker was, uh, was staying with Keith C when he came in town on that weekend. And uh, C was not, to invite all the participants to come over to his house that night and stay as long as they like. Well, I went over there and I, Mr. Parker pulled me over in a corner and he, he went in there and he got the, he just finished the yellow belt manual, the new yellow belt manual and the orange belt manual. And he wanted to show those to me. And we sat and talked for like an hour and a half. Now, when I tested, I knew all the material up through first degree black belt, which included the 24 extensions of orange, the 24 extensions of uh, purple. And, and that blew Mr. Parker away. He goes, how in the world did you do that? And he said, most people, he said, what I require is people to show me they're getting a grasp of the system. He said, most people don't get through orange belt. <laughs> I said, Mr. Parker, I wasn't uh, testing for orange belt. I was testing for black belt, sir. That's the way I was raised. <laughs> and so he liked that. So, you know, I got, I got Dick up to a certain point and his, his year of probation <clears throat> had, had come to an end. And I called Mr. Parker and I said, Mr. Parker, you have any plans on coming to Texas or anywhere near here? I've got a guy that's through his one year of probation and he needs to test. And he goes, well, I'm going to uh, do a seminar in Albuquerque, New Mexico on March 26th. And uh, he said, if you'll bring him there, he said, we'll do the test there. He what, goes, year was this? what year was this, sir? 1988. Okay. And he goes, do you know the material for second? And I said, yes, sir. He said, all right, you're testing for second. And I said, okay. And so I tested that night and uh, Mr. Parker told me, he said, you know, you haven't had an instructor since you've been in Kempo and now you do. And you're now one of my students and I will take care of you. And so, but he also, he said, there's something I want you to work on when you go back home. And I said, what's that, sir? He said, you're already doing this to a certain level, but I want you to take it to a higher level. I want you to uh, figure out as much as you can about controlling height, width, and depth. And so that's when I came back. I dug back into to the insight books real heavily, looked at everything there, was getting in classes, working with my students, and trying to take that to a higher level. And to, uh, sadly to me, this isn't taught uh, 
by the majority of the instructors out there anymore. And what, to, what is that? High, uh, controlling height, width, and depth. Okay. All right. And do you to focus uh, in your classes, though. Do you uh, do you reference anything of the uh, the divisions of the arts? There's there's several of them. Do you know those? Uh, which ones are you referring to? Well, like in, in reference to his first book, in Infinite Insights, he talked about uh, laying out the importance of Kempo. And the reason why uh, I've said this in several previous uh, Zoom meetings uh, with the others that uh, once with Chuck Sullivan laughing at me because he, uh, Mr. Parker did that to him in 1962. Uh, he did that to me in 1982 about the basics and the secrets of uh, of Kempo Karate. So there was three facets and it's in the, uh, in the infinite insights. And so I, I referenced that. So he was big on basics, very strong on the basics, many qu uh, quotes under that. I'm just curious if, did you follow like that format to really reinforce that on a regular basis? You know, I did after, uh, I, you know, I got the infinite insights and started looking at them. Uh, and, and again, it's, uh, one of, one of the things that, that I always want my students to also understand why they do everything they do. Just like what Mr. Parker used to emphasize when he taught seminars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah, it's a, I remember one seminar, Mr. Parker was saying that uh, he had taught a seminar, I think the week before, and that's what he referred to, and he asked people, said, well, what would y'all like to learn? And this one guy goes, you know, I'd, I'd like to learn the secrets. And he goes, okay. And so they got out there and they did basics for about an hour and 15 minutes. And so the guy was holding his hand up and Mr. Parker said, yes, sir. And he says, uh, I thought we were going to work on the secrets. And Mr. Parker says, we have been for that last hour and 15 minutes. Where you been at? Exactly. Let, we're going on with that and, and see, in Infinite Insights book one, he lays it out three parts, obviously the basics, self-defense and freestyle. So let's go into uh, moving from the basics to self-defense and techniques. Obviously there is what, when I came up, it was called the base move, but it was evolved into being called the ideal phase. All yeah. right. And I'm gonna guess you can explain how you present the ideal phase to your students. Well, you know, just like Mr. Parker used to show everything, you have to teach the people how to do it mechanically. And then you have to start taking all of those stops and starts and everything else in there. But uh, a, a great example of that in Yellow Belt, about seven or eight years ago, I taught a, uh, at a camp in Colleyville, Texas. And when I got to the black belt class, I said, okay, I said, uh, we're gonna work on short form one. And all the black belts kind of looked at me with a startled look on their face and kind of rolled their eyes back in there. And I said, all right, you know, just, we're not gonna do the salutation, just go to the meditative horse. And I said, now step back and, you know, go into, the first sequence of motion in short one, which you're stepping from a horse stance back into a right neutral bow with a right hammering inward block. And I said, now, name me 12 things that you can explain to a student that they just learned there. And everybody's looking at me like, what? And they probably came up with about eight things that they learned in that first motion. And they're going like 12? I said, yeah. And at the time, I think I had 37 things written down. I now have about 46. And so again, you know, uh, I see people go through forms and stuff. To me, they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. There's not power where it's supposed to be. There's not being in sync when they hit their stances and executing their block strikes or whatever. So how do you address that then? If somebody is not doing it, is this, a, you're talking about a student of yours or is this somebody else's student? No, I'm, I'm talking about anybody that I teach. Okay. 
uh, again, you have to show them what you're trying to uh, explain to them. It's like in 2000, I learned to be a professional horse trainer. And there was one thing that I was trying to learn how to do was change leads on a horse. And, you know, I asked the guy that was explaining to me, I said, well, how, how, he said, well, you'll feel it when it's right. And I said, so what am I supposed to feel? Well, I can't explain that to you. Okay, well, how, how do I know that I'm there when I feel it? <laughs> he said, well, you'll, you'll finally understand it. Now, for instance, 1988, I asked Mr. Parker, I said, uh, I said, Mr. Parker, I said, I got a question for you. He said, what's that? And I said, when I teach short form one to beginner students, I teach it with twist throughs. And you know how uh, Mr. Parker could get very animated at times. He'd go, oh, oh my God, why in the world would you even consider doing that? And what is your answer? My answer was that when I first came into Kempo, I'm watching, you know, I watched everybody. And I'm seeing people go through short form one and other forms. And to me, they didn't have power with what they were doing. Now, it gets back to the horse training deal. If, if I step back and I do a twist through, which some people's gonna say, oh no, you can't do that, that's wrong, which is okay. That's their opinion. I honor their opinion, just like, you know, they need to honor mine on certain things. If they don't, that's all right too. If you come out of that twist through and throw that block, it gives you full body momentum to feel what that block should feel like. Then when they get into orange belt, I make them start doing that with step throughs. But they got to look for that same amount of power with those blocks and stuff. So what you're doing is you're trying to teach them outside of the curriculum of the form, you're trying to teach them more of an advanced movement, correct? Well, it's not such an advanced movement. It's, uh, you know, I, I had a brown belt ask me one time, or actually he was one, he'd, he'd got up to black belt by then. He goes, you know, I've heard people say Mr. Parker used to pe teach people different ways to do something. He said, that's not true, is it? And I said, well, sure it's true. And he goes, why would you do that? And I said, because if you take 10 people as a general rule and you show them something, eight of them might get it right off the bat. Two of them may struggle with that situation. Now, I'm gonna pick on one of my students, Jeff Nichols. And uh, you've met Jeff. Sure I have, nice Jeff man. Jeff Dilexit. So that really creates a challenge sometimes to teach him something because he sees everything backwards. Now, you won't find somebody that puts out more effort and tries harder than Jeff. And, and again, I love teaching him, but you know, when I first started teaching him, it was kind of frustrating. And so uh, again, lots of times I've got to look for a different way to explain it to Jeff than I just did to 15 other people. Okay. Let's go back. Let's go back to your technique, though, on the self-defense. So, do you basically just cover the initial ideal phase first? Do you? When do you introduce? When I was coming up, it was called rearrangement, but later it was called the equation formula. When do you enter that into uh, the process of teaching with the student? I generally don't necessarily do a whole lot of that in yellow belt, but I start doing it in orange belt. And again, I will do it to a certain degree in yellow belt, but I want them to get a base under what they're doing because again, once they hit orange belt, it's gonna get a lot more complex. You got twice as many techniques, et cetera, and your knowledge should start expanding. But uh, my guys will tell you, uh, and Mr. King's on here, I'm gonna know Mr. Fansford's on here, Mr. King's a fifth, Mr. Fansler's a fourth. We go back and visit Yellow Belt quite often. And, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of times in uh, Black Belt seminars, I'll tell people, okay, we're gonna work on some Black Belt material. We're gonna work on, say, checking the storm. I see. Let, let me ask you this. God, we're going to, I'm gonna jump back again to basics. When is a block a strike 
or is a strike a block or vice versa? Now, Mr. Parker said at black belt level, you'd have no blocks. Okay, explain why you would say that. So, uh, do I? I say explain why you would say that. Well, you know, because uh, black belt level. I'll tell you why, sir, is I don't want to wait three years to find out that. <laughs> so please explain to me, I'm a, I'm a white belt becoming a yellow belt. Well, ag again, I don't teach white belts to be yellow belts. I teach white belts to be black belts. I don't teach yellow belts to be orange belts. You know, I, I don't look at it that way. I'm going to teach a student to what their ultimate goal is. And but Mr. Parker used to talk about at black belt level, you have no blocks because everything should create damage and pain. Okay. And what Mr. Parker says, you know, to make it a strike, most time you just have to extend it. You know, Mr. Parker also used to say in our defense is our offense. Uh, so we have to take those words and look at them and try to figure out what he means. At what point do you teach? I'm going to reference book one, the eight considerations uh, that are there in that you need to be aware of in Kempo. I start teaching that at Yellow Belt. Okay. Why don't you walk us through that a little bit? I'm going to apply. Now, an, another place that that applied in my life real heavily is me being in law enforcement. Uh, How many years were you a, a law enforcement officer? I was a police officer for two years. I was a deputy sheriff for four and a half. Okay. Thank you very much for your service. Tell us about how that applied in your life, what you learned from that. Well, you know, to me, Kempo has completely changed everything I do in life. Uh, even when I train horses, I use Kempo principles and concepts to train horses to make it easier. Do you yell at the horse or do you key eye? Nah, I, I, <laughs> I'm messing with you, Tommy, just nah. a little bit. Well, you know, one of Mr. Uh, Gray's students said last year after I did a technique on him, he goes, now I know why his horses do what he tells them to do. So, <laughs> but he, he was just being kind to me. But uh, yeah, if, if you've got an 1,100 pound pissed off animal on the end of a, a 15 or a 22 foot lead rope, you better have some ideas how to make body motion happen uh, or you're in a bad situation. But, uh, but, you know, again, you know, I heard a black belt say one time, well, we don't teach our lower belts anything about concepts and principles until they get to brown belt level. And I said, why not? And they said, well, we don't feel like they'll understand it. I said, you know, if you throw water on a duck, it won't get wet. If that duck stands under a waterfall, it'll eventually get wet. Or if you keep spraying it with a water hose, it will get wet. So I start talking concepts and principles to a guy the first night he's on the map. And there's a few people probably watching this that's heard this. Or, or, you know, heard me tell them this. Because again, they may not get it at first, but if you keep expressing what those concepts and principles are and showing them examples of them, then they're gonna start learning how to utilize that. I see. Do you use a lot of terminology to reinforce these principles or do you try to keep it simple so that they'll understand and then walk them up in, in, in the, uh, in the terminology? Well, you know, both. I mean, you can do, you can, there can be paralysis by too much analysis. Is oh yeah. Exactly. So but they're overwhelmed with what they're doing. One of the first things that I tell my students that they need to buy all the infant insights. The other thing that I tell them, they need to read them twice a year. Okay. Or every time they change ranks. I see. Uh, when, when you're talking about that, okay, let's go back to that. You're talking about the infinite insights. And in book one, all these considerations have been, have been addressed and whatnot. What's a heavy portion of your teaching with the student? In other words, on the basics, do you focus on a certain part of 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 your teaching well at, at first i'm gonna i'm gonna focus uh heavily into stances and maneuvers okay you know and a, again that's first thing mr parker said we got to have you know if you don't have a foundation none of the rest of it's going to work 
you know? I, I, I can see that because I've noticed it lightly a lot as you, we use the social media, which is a great tool to communicate and educate each other and to learn and exchange ideas. However, it also reveals a lot of, of misconceptions and poor execution. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're seen to be a slapping art or flapping like a broken fan in the wind. How do you get around that so that doesn't happen to your students? Well, and, and, and again, my students will tell you that I'm always correcting them, but I'm always self-correcting myself too. Uh, a good example of that, what you're saying, is one of my former students, he asked me one day, he said, do you know Scott Castor? And I said, Scott Castor, Larry Castor's son. Now, Larry Castor who, is who I made black belt under in Taekwondo. And he said, yes. He said, he's one of my best friends. Well, a week later, he came out there and he said, Scott Castor uh, asked me to ask you if it'd be possible for him to come out to class and let you evaluate his motion that he has a problem with that nobody can figure out what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. Well, Scott came out and I hadn't seen Scott since he was a little snot nosed, like seven or eight year old. And uh, now he's a full grown man and a police officer. And I was talking to him and he said, you know, when I told, when Kenneth told me he was teaching Kempo and I told my dad, my dad said, you go see him and he'll fix your problem. And I said, okay, uh, tell me something about this problem. And he said, there's something wrong when I blitz and I can't figure, we can't figure it out. And I said, so it's just when you blitz. And he goes, yes, sir. And I said, okay, uh, walk out there on the mat and blitz. So he went out there and did a blitz. And I said, you're dragging your rear foot. He goes, what? I said, you're dragging your rear foot. Now I correct people on this all the time. And what I'm saying, when they do a push drag forward, step drag forward, or do a front crossover step out, that rear foot, say that they're, they're in a right neutral bow. Their feet are on 45. When they start maneuvering, that rear foot starts, the toes start turning out. Now they're on a 90 and sometimes they're more than a 90. You know, that kills your maneuverability. If you don't think so, try to walk like that. And uh, so again, he goes, wow, you looked at that one time and told me what the problem was? You know, Mr. Parker told me one time, he said, you always have to remember Kempo is logical motion. If it's not logical, figure out how to fix it. Well, let's go on to a thing like that. I notice on your gi, which most of us have worn at some point, a similar patch. I see that you have the universal pattern. Yep. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. You can give us your opinions on it. Tell us what is the key to the universal pattern? Well, uh, I'm not really sure, you know, exactly uh, for sure what you're asking, but the universal pattern shows us all the different ways that we can move but it's also uh, just one portion of a nine spear uh, assembly of all the different ways we can move, you know, both reverse and opposite. I see. Well, the reason I asked that is that in, the, in, in volume uh, four, book four, he brings this, this uh, discussion to the, the foreground and he talks about it. And obviously it's a geometric type of pattern that shows continuous motion from all aspects for, that we can deal with, obviously using the clock pattern, going in uh, and you can look at it in 3D. And once you do that, you start to realize the possibilities are infinite. However, I think the key word Mr. Parker related to was the word interpretation. So I'm asking you, what is your interpretation of the universal pattern? And with that being the case, how to convey that to assist your students in their learning? Well, you know, I, and I've got a big universal pattern hanging on my wall. So, you know, what I'll do when I'm, when I'm emphasizing different things, you know, like elongated circles and stuff like that, I will take that universal pattern 
and show them that elongated circle, you know, on that uh, universal pattern, whether it's a large circle, more condensed circle, or a very small condensed elongated circle. Because like you say, everything in, in Kempo is referred to, uh, everything advanced in Kempo is supposed to be based on the figure eight. The figure eight has no stops and starts. And that's one of the things that I really emphasize when, you know, when I teach techniques and stuff like that is to try to eliminate all of the unnecessary stops and starts that can be involved in that technique, et cetera. Because uh, uh, again, I don't do an extended outward block for- Why, sort of Why wouldn't you do that? Why would I not do what? An extended outward block. Why would I? Why would I why not? Why wouldn't you? You just said I would. I wouldn't do an extended outward block. You know, again, uh, I I teach it at a lower level, but then we we bring that up to a higher level because if I come from here and I bring this out right here, what did and, and to this block, what did I just do? It wound up stopping. Now I've got less, I've got right at a quarter of a circle to try to execute that strike. So I've killed my power, I've killed my speed. Now I've got to try to grain all that back in less than, a, you know, basically a quarter of a circle. Well, the only problem with that is that, you know, a few months ago or a few weeks back, we've had several of the seniors here. Chuck Sullivan swears by the extended outward block, not the traditional outward block because it puts him in a position to strike, and it's usually a continuous effort. You're only gonna be do more than one thing at a time. However, when I'm talking with Joe Demick, who's been around with Mr. Parker since the late 50s, he was actually uh, Tracy's and, and whatnot. He, he uses the same concept, but he uses his circles. He calls it three shields. And his shields are the circles from in front, horizontal, vertical, and, and, and trying to encamp, encompass the universal pattern that way. However, the, the point I'm going to share with you is that when you've got that and you're using these motions, um, how do you incorporate? Because I, I never, I don't see too often uh, a movement where will I in in the primitive stages of Kempo. There's primitive mechanical spontaneous. That was the three triangles that I was taught coming in, and your primitive is your basic embryonic stage yes there's going to be a hiccup where the individual's going to hold maybe the block because he's learning to block because he's never had any formal training technically he may have but he's coming into that school in the martial arts so i don't believe it will just be an extended outward and stop there it would be continuous motion so that you're actually setting yourself up for your counter strike so Okay, so you don't like to teach the extended outward block, correct? No, I teach it, but at the uh, orange belt level, I start advancing it up to something I feel works better. What is that then? That is a uh, right outward parry that elongates and comes back in. So you open hand rather than a closed hand. Right. Okay. And again, I, te I teach both of them. Okay, okay. Now, uh, I'm sorry, were well, you going to say something? about using that extended outward what's it also do it puts his right shoulder in motion coming forward okay uh, now, moving, moving out of this area looking at this uh you're uh, i'm guessing you've also explored the web of knowledge which is covered in mr parker's book number five have you ever looked at that and thought about that and tried to incorporate that or how does that work in your curriculum of uh the ed parker system well, you know, I, again, I teach the, I, I came in uh, in 86 and at the time Mr. Parker was using the 24 technique curriculum. Uh, and, and I don't know when he changed the 32 down to the 24, but then he put the infinite insights together. And that's where he put the web of knowledge using that 24 curriculum in those books. Did you get a chance to talk to him about any of these concepts, principles? Not at any depth, no. No, okay. When was the last time you actually got a chance to see, when was the last time you actually saw him? 
Last time I actually saw Mr. Parker was June 17, 1990. He came in and did a seminar uh, for Keith Gorham in Fort Worth on uh, June 16th. Uh, he asked me if uh, my wife and I would pick him up to go to dinner that night. Uh, I dropped Mr. Parker back off at his hotel at about 11.15, 11.30. And he told me that he needed to have a meeting with me the next morning prior to him going back to LA. And I said, oh, yes, sir. And I said, what time? And he said, four o'clock. And I said, okay, four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. He said, no, in the morning. And uh, he said, Darlene had booked him back into LAX. And when he first looked at his tickets and seen that, he was quite upset because, <laughs> and he said, <laughs> Why, why have you booked me back in first thing Sunday morning? You know, I always stay over and do a private lesson with students uh, after this, uh, the next day. And Darlene told him, she said, you know, Daddy, we can't remember the last time you were home on Father's Day. And she said, this year we want you home. Nice. And that was the was year. very family oriented. Mr. Parker it, you know, really admired, and, and that was one of the number one things in his life, family first. And uh, I, that's very admirable that, you know, that would happen. Uh, let's go on to something else. So, so the final phase in book one of the three divisions of the art is freestyling. How much freestyling do you uh, engage with your students? What do you try to cover? Obviously, you don't, you weren't not a big fan of tournament fighting, as you had expressed earlier in Taekwondo. Right. What do you use in freestyling in your school? One of, one of the things that, that I probably stress most is the yellow belt freestyle techniques. Now, I will teach the other techniques. Now, and the reason, the reason I, I stress the yellow belt techniques uh, more heavy than I do anything else is again, Mr. Parker put me doing the, uh, studying the controlling height, width, and depth. Because if you do B1A and stuff correctly, you totally eliminate people's height, width, and depth. And, you know, it's right now, uh, virtually all of my students are either black belt or brown belt level. And so uh, I haven't taught lower students in several years because of some projects and things that I'm involved working on and uh, just not at this point in time I'm not interested in having a big mixed group of uh, students. So you work on the uh, the B1A, B2 and et cetera, et cetera in the yellow B3, B4A and, exactly. and what do you get from that especially with your advanced students I would think they've covered this for all can it be more spontaneous or is it still back to primitive mechanical spontaneous? Do you use the concepts of rearrangement or, you know, the equation formula? How do you change it? Because there's so much there. I mean, this is supposed to be an attack at you, not a, uh, an organized response, uh, technique that we're talking about. Well, like, like I say, you know, I see a lot of people and originally I did this too. They do B1A and they grab the wrist and they pull it off here to the side. That does not control height, width, and depth. I have a rule with my students, if you touch a wrist, you twist it. By, by coming in, you know, I, one of the things that I stress and be like, say, let's just take B1A. Okay. Thing's gonna be margin of error. Okay. You know, all the time, they just reach out and they grab that wrist. If they're off an inch, inch and a half, do they get that wrist or do they miss it? You tell me. <laughs> they miss it. They miss it. Okay. So what I teach people to do is come in there and hit it with the back of their forearm and then roll over and slide down, Coke bottle in and grab that wrist as they twist it, anchor their elbow. So we're picking up margin of error anchored elbows, rotating that wrist, which is automatically gonna take his shot right shoulder out of the equation. We're also pulling him forward. 
So we're pulling him down, which helps control height. And then I teach going through that elbow with a uh, right ear block that turns into that right punch. So when you hit him with that right punch, now you're controlling all of height, width, and depth. How often do you cover this material? Do you do this every session you teach, or is this once a week, or? No, you know, I, you know, I cover things like that and, until a student starts uh, getting a good knowledge of it. And it, you know, if we need to go back to it, we will, but I'm, I'm not gonna cover that every session. Okay, well, what about though, do you just freestyle period without organized responses? In other words, no. just two people uh, on the mat, they're going to punch, kick, Etc. Like, like I say, right now, my major three students here at my school is a fifth degree, a fourth degree, and a third brown. Mm -hmm. So, again, these guys have all, you know, my black belts have had years of free fighting experience. And so we don't spend so much time working on those free fighting. I asked Mr. Parker one time, you know, how much time should my students be spending doing free fighting? And I was shocked at his answer. And he said, if it's street freak fighting, that's fine. If you're doing stuff for point fighting, not more than 15 or 20% of your time. Now, when I first, when I first started fighting <clears throat> in 66, like I say, we had the old term light contact, which is one inch penetration to the face, three inch penetration to the body. Then they came out with protective gear. Well, here in Texas, we said, okay, now we got three inch penetration to the face and six inch penetration to the body. Well, of course, we was getting disqualified for that. <clears throat> so, you know, and so they took, they basically took all the fun out of, of free fighting. And then, you know, in, in the last one, uh, he's talking about Mr. LeBounty. 2008, Mr. Labounty and I standing at the internationals, and they was fixing to start the fighting. And we walked up there and very first fight. You know, it's one guy blitzed this other, other, other gentleman, and the guy that got blitzed, he starts running, throws his hand out behind him, and touches the guy. Point! And Mr. Labounty looked at me and he goes, wouldn't you really love to see a real tournament again? Do your said, students compete in tournaments? Do what? Do your students compete in tournaments? If they want to. That's up to them. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm guessing you encourage them to do that. Oh, I encourage them to do anything they want to do. I see. I see. Let, you know, you're talking about you're using the, um, the fighting techniques uh, for the yellow belt. Obviously, you're using the backhand slap to, the, to a grasp and then strike the opponent. What is your opinion on grappling and the grappling uh, arts that we see today? And do you think that should be incorporated in Campo's curriculum? Okay, let me back up just a second. Now, I've got a lot of respect for a lot of good tournament fighters. And, you know, a very good friend of mine, you probably heard of, Ray McCallum. And, uh, you know, he's one of the best. And, again, I've, I've been in classes with many of the this, you know, I've been in several classes with Mr. Trejo. So again, I'm not saying that's wrong, right, or indifferent. You know, to me, uh, I wanted to spend more time personally doing self-defense. When I was on the street as a deputy sheriff, I covered 953 square miles. For the first four and a half to five hours that I was on Sundays, I had no backup. Somebody asked me one time, what happens if you, need, if you need backup? And I said, I get mean. They said, well, what if you really need backup? And I said, I get real damn mean. So again, you know, if, if I had to have backup, it was a police officer coming from one of two cities we had in the county. And at certain places in the county, that was 40 minutes if they was running 100 plus miles an hour. Okay, so you would obviously, as a deputy, sheriff or a police officer would just collectively put them together you did not strike uh you would not strike a, a possible suspect but you would have to use some kind of of um of of restraint so did you use any grappling techniques to to do that or I mean, how did you make them comply well he may not strike them 
Well, I'm asking you. You're explain I wasn't there, so I'm asking you. That I was going to do what I needed to do. Okay. Uh, again, I one of the uh, well, let's talk about grappling on. Don't want to get me in trouble saying I got out on the street and hit somebody. And but let, let me let me emphasize this: in four and a half years as a deputy sheriff, I arrested probably. 50% more criminals than any other deputy in our department and I only had to put hands on two of them in four and a half years. I was certified to carry a taser for four years of those. Never got to tase anybody. It was on my bucket list, but I didn't get to do it. I also carried an ASP, which is the same length as my Kempo sticks. Did never get to use an ASP on anybody which again, might've been on the bucket list, I wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the only thing I ha ever had to kill was a 2011 Dodge diesel truck. So I was very fortunate there. Now, as far as uh, I had two individuals that decided that they were gonna whip my butt. And, uh, you know, I, I, told, I, I told this one gentleman, this was on, Sunday morning at 11.15 in the morning. He had started drinking whiskey at four o'clock the day before out of a gallon jug. And when I got there Sunday morning, there was probably a half inch left in that bottle. And, <clears throat> but public intoxication says you have to be a danger to yourself or other, someone else. So he really wasn't showing me anything other than being very intoxicated, but I couldn't prove that he was that far intoxicated either, that he was a danger to himself till he stood up and he almost went face first off of a deck that everybody's trailer house. And I told him I was, I was placed under arrest for public intoxication because he was a danger to himself. And he looked at me and he said, tell you what, boy, you think you're tough enough? Bring your happy little butt up here and see if you can do that. I said, all right. So I went up there, and when I was putting it in my Tahoe, he goes, what happened? And I said, well, apparently I was tough enough to come up there and do that. Now, both situations of him and an oil field worker who's uh, about the size of Mr. Gray's, which is about 6'2", six 6'2 two, six two and a half, and about 240 pounds. And, uh, you know, he was the other guy I had to put hands on. And... Both of those wound up being wrist locks and putting cuffs on them, putting them in a vehicle. Now, to me, what we have going on all over this country right now is totally uh, avoidable. You know, the last class that I took for off the sheriff's office was uh, intermediate use of force. <clears throat> and the instructor teaching that class uh, said he was a fourth degree BJJ black belt under the Gracies. And he was showing videos of a situation in Seattle. And I remember this, this is seven or eight years ago. Well, it's longer now, but uh, <clears throat> where a officer stopped this uh, black lady for a traffic offense and a whole crowd gathered around her car and his car, and another lady comes up and gets in his face and won't back off. So he finally decides to arrest her. And uh, so it must have took him eight minutes to put a set of cuffs on this woman. And so, you know, this, this young instructor, he's probably, well, he's young to me. He was in his 20s, and I was way up there uh, in my 60s. And he goes, anybody have a problem with that? And a couple of people said something. <clears throat> he said, well, the problem I got, he should have took her instantly to the ground and got her under control. Is that your position? My ain't mine. Well, what about your position, though? My position, I'm going to keep on my feet. Okay. So you're not going to go to the ground. So you, are you a fan? Are you, do you advocate for grappling or not? I advocate to... Uh, understand grappling, but we got a lot of grappling in the Kempo system standing okay. on our feet. Absolutely. Okay, but I mean, right now, it seems like the, the, 
the hot topic is grappling and, and ground, which is a completely different animal well, to what we are. We're a striking system, so it's well, like apples and oranges, and I, I guess. That, that's the thing about it, Paul. That's what they're teaching in all the police academies in Texas now. Because that's because of legality, sir. We know that it's because the civil liability. I mean, if that is not the case, we wouldn't have had the civil unrest we have right now in this country with uh, the death of a black man in Minnesota. Exactly. When the police officer placed his knee on, had he had the proper training and if the proper support by the fellow officers had intervened, this man may be alive today. However, how many Wait. times does this happen? So let's move away from the grappling aspect. Let's talk about uh, putting a weapon in your hand. About that before we do. What's that, sir? I asked him, I said, so what do you think all these people standing around is going to do if he had done that? Well, what do you mean by that? I said, I think they're going to kick or stomp the ever loving crap out of him. Well, that could be a slight possibility. Two videos later, was an officer, same situation uh, in New Orleans, a black officer, that that happened to him. And again, you watching these clowns on doing this writing right now, they don't. One person goes up and starts, you know, a fight with somebody, and eight other people jump on top of him. Well, you that know? has to deal. That has to deal with a social uh, statement, which we have a lack of respect for police officers, which well, is something outside of that. We have to think of ourselves, and that's why I want to stay focused on why you teach Kempo. And so now we're knowing that people are very agitated. We know that people are very aggressive. You had that firsthand experience as a law enforcement officer and also as a martial arts instructor. Uh, one of the things that you've taught, wanted to talk about, and uh, I think is really a hot topic. We've had this uh, over the weekend. We had a discussion with um, Marty uh, 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 Zanovich as well as Huck Planis. We've spoken with others uh, regarding uh, the use of knives. Let's talk about Kempo Knife uh, curriculum. Give us a brief overview of where you're at with it, uh, what are you, how you're supporting it, and then we're going to open up uh, some questions for our viewers after we get done with this segment. So if you have a question, this is going to be the time it's going to come up. So Mr. Burks, please explain your, uh, your position on knife and the knife curriculum. Okay, now that goes back to the last time I sat down and talked to Mr. Parker on June 17th, 1990. You know, I had asked Mr. Parker if there was a Form 8, and he said, yes, there is. He said, but I'm not teaching that right now. And what was the reason for that? Mr. Parker stated that that form needed to be revised up to the, the standards that he was using in his curriculum for self-defense at that, at that present time. And who devised that form? I didn't ask him. Okay. I did ask him, I said, uh, basically, how, I said, I, I've heard that you possibly taught that to a handful of people. And he said, yes. And I said, could I ask if Larry Tatum was one of them? And he said, yes. Now, so, and that's basically as far as we went on that right there, because he said that, you know, it's like all, everything else, he was in the point of revising the manuals, everything else at that time. And he, you know, he hadn't got up to that level yet. So he never formally uh, authorized an official version of that. Do what, sir? He never authorized an official version of, of his knife form. Right. He actually, he did put that in print. Uh, how, many, how many versions were in print, do you know? Was it just one, two, ten? I actually, I found two versions of it. They both read the same, but the now the first one said Form 7. And during that day, Mr. Parker told me, he said, uh, and he said, you know, originally the knife form was called Form 7. He said, but when I developed the club form, you know, to me, the knives are more versatile and more dangerous than the club. So I moved the clubs to a higher level. So it's Form 8. Okay. In his files that I had, Darlene gave me access to, uh, she gave me access uh, originally to about 130 different computer files. In those files, there's two versions of Form 8. The only, you know, one, the first one says Form 7, 
The second one is titled Form 8, Old Form 7. And the only difference is, is in the second one, he had put names to the techniques. I see. Okay, and I also asked Mr. Parker about Speak with a Knife. And Mr. Oh, Parker, oh, it's called Speak with the Knife. Okay, I was going to ask you the title no, of that book. No. Hey, did you read that at all? No, Speak with a Knife is something different, Paul. What is that then? 1988, I was made aware of a project Mr. Parker was looking at doing called Speak with a Knife, which was a knife curriculum that he was going to bring into Kempo. Now, the reason Mr. Parker had decided to do that, he told me, he said, you know, there's a lot of good knife systems out there, but that's not how we move. And he said, I want a knife curriculum built on how we move, utilizing concepts and principles of American Kempo. Okay, in 2017, uh, a few weeks before I came out and was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I'm sure you probably remember this. Uh, I was there, I think. <laughs> uh, in September, due to some uh, a doctor mess messing up my medicine, it created me passing out and falling after I'd walked in from our garage into our house, and I went face first into a granite cabinet, which flipped me over backwards, and I wound up busting the back of my head open also. So I wound up with two major concussions. And they care flighted me into plain old med. The next day they kicked me out and said, okay, you're all right, go home. And so uh, in November, I started having problems. Well, actually I started having problems in October. Uh, and I had lost my memory, I'd, I'd lost my ability to speak twice. You know, I started losing memory off and on. Uh, forbid. Yeah, and again, I was having extremely uh, severe headaches uh, and uh, et cetera. And the back of my head was just, you know, it, found it felt like somebody was hitting me with a two pound hammer in the back of the head all the time. Well, it took me weeks to get in to see a neurologist. And when I went in to see a neurologist, you know, he, he gets out his little iPad and he goes, well, you know, people your age, and I said, it ain't got a damn thing to do with my age, doc. I said, even though I am old, I'll admit that, don't like it, but I can't do anything about that. I said, I didn't have this problem before I fell, and now I got it. He goes, well, maybe we ought to do an MRI on you. <laughs> and I said, okay. He said, well, come up here tomorrow. We got an MRI here in my office. We'll do another MRI on you. So I'll go up there. He said, I won't be here, but an associate of mine will be. And said, he'll run the MRI. Well, before they even got completely through with that MRI, that doctor come in there and told my wife, BJ, he said, we're getting him out of that machine. You need to get him over to TMC, which is Texas Medical Center Hospital, right there close to him, as fast as you can get him there. He has two, two brain bleeds. Right. And so he said, we, we've got, we've already notified doctors. Doctors are waiting on him. So they rushed me over there. They rushed me in. They did a, uh, I think a, an ultrasound or something like that, a, son, uh, a CT scan. They did a CT scan on me and took me up to a room. A neurologist come up there and he walked in and introduced himself. And he said, I've looked at your MRI and your CT scan. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> and he said, you've got two brain bleeds, one on each side of your, your skull, and they're shutting your brain down. And he said, first thing in the morning, we're going to go in there and drill a hole in the left side of your head to see if that blood will come out. And he said, if it doesn't, we're going to go back in there the next day and drill one on the other side. And so luckily, them doing that and put tubes in there, that blood drained out of there, but he said it was old blood. And he said, I probably had those brain bleeds when they released me in Plano. I see. Let me ask you this. Is, that, is this affecting your ability to teach or to uh, execute in, in the Kempo world? Or, or you know, uh, what is the status of your health right now? It's, you know, 
Uh, it's, it's fairly good. It affects my balance just a little bit, but I'm not sure because I've had two uh, major toe surgeries on my big toe on my right foot this year. So again, your big toe affects you know, you know, majority of your balance, so it's hard to say if that's effects or not. Well, we're glad, you know, let me just say this much. We are happy that you could be here, you know, because honestly, you know, health is the most precious commodity that we have. I mean, we've had, uh, uh, you know, some of the seniors on here. Bob White was on here. Obviously, his book, you know, uh, it was an amazing inspiration for me. I'm so happy to hear that you're doing better. So tell us, let's take it back, though, to the ninth curriculum. So okay. where are you at with that, sir? Okay, now this, this is, but I want to bring this up. While I was laying there in the hospital with those two brain, brain bleeds, one of the things I got to thinking about, what if I gave back to Kempo? And I decided that, you know, I wanted to come up with a Form 8 for my guys uh, and, and basically on the guidelines of what Mr. Parker said. And, you know, then they started talking to me about doing a regular knife curriculum. And so actually I have came up with a form eight. I'm still tweaking it a little bit, getting it where I, exactly where I wanted. But right now uh, I've got several good people working with me. My guys, uh, Mr. Hildebrand, Mr. Graves, uh, Jeff Nichols, who's an IT guy. Uh, is it based, is your form your knife form is it based on parker's base yes or is it is it just an interpretation of it it's it's based on his base as much as i could I see. the 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 problem with the written material on form eight mr parker talks about what he's doing with the knife but he doesn't say what the attack is he does not say what levels that's on now, the first year that Darlene had a luau, uh, which was four or five years ago on the, for Mr. Parker's birthday, I came out there and she allowed me to look through, she told me I had access to all of Mr. Parker's records. Okay. Looking through a box, I found a deal that said knives. And I opened that and I seen uh, a lot of stuff Mr. Parker had wrote out and he made a bunch of drawings on this. Mm -hmm. And it said knife set two, dated February 16th, 1972. And so I'm going like, oh, well, what's this? And then Darlene told me, she thought that, she said, I think I've got a video of my dad teaching Form 8. So she went and found it, and it really wasn't Form 8, it was Mr. Parker teaching Ernie George Knife Set 2, the different deals. And you know, I've all, you can also find a, a video clip on YouTube, Mr. Parker teaching at Joe Palonzo's, uh, and he's showing things out of that knife set too, on that on his seminar. Are you in CD? Are you envisioning any time in the near future, either this will be finalized or will come to text, will be published? Well, you know, I've offered my form eight to anybody that's in the IKKA, the higher level black belts. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put it out there on DVD uh, or anything else. I'm not interested in doing that. Now, what I've what I've done with my curriculum is, or what we're doing with my curriculum. Like I said I got a lot of good people helping me on this. Okay. But we are setting up right now. Basically, this is going to be a uh, internet-based curriculum that people can get into. Now, Mr. Parker, one of the reasons Mr. Parker had decided not to do speak with a knife was because Mrs. Parker had seen what they was doing with this and you know she felt like somebody would learn this and use it in an incorrect manner and Mr. Parker would feel responsible for this. So I suggested to Mr. Parker, I said, you know, Mr. Parker, would you think about just allowing your guys to have that information, the, the black belts that you have confidence in that would use that material and not teach it to somebody uh, that didn't need to know it. Right. And so, you know, he liked that idea. And actually he called me December 10th uh, before going to Hawaii. And he told me when he come back from Hawaii, we'd talk about that further, but he liked what I suggested. 
Did you yeah. ever train with any other of the uh, Parker black belts at any given time? Yes. Okay, and who who would, it would, did they have any knowledge regarding this? Or? Yeah. Well, uh, well, not well, regarding what, Paul. Well, I'm guessing with the knife or with other aspects of advanced teaching. Well, you know, I I uh, I, I trained with Mr. Pick for two and a half days and in Phoenix and uh, on June 6th through 8th in 1988. And, you know, he, he showed me a couple of things there. And, uh, but, you know, also attended a seminar he did in Irving, Texas, I believe. Who? I'm not gonna hold you to dates. It's okay on that. I'm just curious. I'm just trying to see what kind of other influences besides Ed Parker's writings or your conversations may have helped develop your a Kempo journey. So maybe you might, did you spend any time with Mr. Trejo? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I taught at several camps that Mr. Trejo taught at. Okay. Except, and, uh, but, you know, in, in 1988, Mr. Parker told me, he said, you know, if you come to California and you cannot get with me, I want you to train with Brian Hawkins. Okay. He said, if you can't get with Brian, I want you to try to get with Barbara Hell. Okay. Okay, and I said, anybody else? And he said, no, those are the two I want you working with. And I said, all right. And so I did that. And I was actually in uh, Mr. Hawkins' uh, association for several years. I you see. Know, actually promoted me to fifth and to sixth. Let me ask you this. If, okay, in the case of your training. Now, are you taking any of – this is something. Let me back it up. In previous discussions with other um, special guests, we've talked about the lack of development – of the techniques involving weapons in the curriculum, there's an original curriculum, and you look at that. Are you taking and e develop anything there? Uh, try to hope to involve uh, to increase uh, some awareness with the knives, the sticks, with guns, because there's only so many techniques from the original book. You know, five or six of one, you know, weapon, five or six of another. Um, and, I mean, any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, I've developed probably five or six more gun techniques. Uh, again, that's something I was always interested in, having a law enforcement background. Uh, I've always also uh, worked on some gun retention uh, techniques because, again, what they, what they taught in the academy was a joke. I mean, absolute joke. Uh, the, when I learned now... The, the one thing I learned from Barbara Hale in 1991 was Form 7. And after I learned Form 7, I started uh, waking up at night and I'd have techniques on, with sticks running through my mind. And the first couple of times that happened, you know, I, I went back to sleep and thought, well, I'll get up in the morning, I'll write all this down. Well, I got up in the morning and I couldn't remember them. So I got to the point where if I woke up and I was thinking of something like that, I got up and I wrote it all down before I went back to bed. So I've developed several uh, manipulation techniques utilizing the sticks. Because, for instance, if uh, if my one of my brown belts or one of my black belts does checking the storm, you know, we we have a uh, technique that could be used by police officers take that stick away from him, do a takedown with him, totally lock him up with it, with that stick. I've got several of those type techniques that we go in and use uh, the stick for contact and control manipulation. Uh, so I've done, I've done some stuff with the guns, I've done some stuff with the sticks. And then again, I've probably developed, uh, I'm wanting to say probably 30 to close to 40 new knife techniques. Okay, well, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to take the weapons out of your hands, and I'm going to ask some of our viewers to ask you direct questions. I ask you, I'm going to be introducing them as they come on, and uh, I asked you the uh, if you direct a question to uh, Master Tommy Burks, please direct it to the material and some of the subject matter that we've covered today, and uh, we thank you for that. So with no further ado, Bert Vickers, how are you, sir? We're going to unmute you, and uh, I would like you to say hello to uh, uh, to uh, Mr. Burks. Can you say hello and say uh, ask him any question you have? 
Uh, I um, I train with him. Uh, we we share a lot of knowledge together. Mr. Burks is we we do Zoom meetings and stuff. So I'm pretty much uh, he answers a lot of my questions every every week. I've got tons and tons of questions about Mr. Parker and who he was, as well as not just the techniques, but he can explain and. He, Really what I'm concerned is, is like, what kind of person Mr. Parker was? You gentlemen trained with him, you know him. Darlene's talked to me, I ask her the same thing. What was he like? Because I see, I see uh, everybody doing their techniques and I see Mr. Parker that way. You guys know him personally. Just like, you know, Frank Trejo, you know him personally. So a lot of times I just, I just ask Mr. Burks about his history and Mr. Parker's teaching. That's all. Okay, Bert. Well, then ask him a question. <laughs> What's your? What was your 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 most memorable moment with Mr. Parker? My most memorable moment with Mr. Parker <clears throat> was the um, last time that he taught uh, at Brian Duffy's in Austin because you know he asked me if, if I was going to stay over and get with him the next morning I told him yes and uh, we was both staying at the La Quinta Inn uh, there right off I-35 and Ben White and he said okay he said why don't you come over about 6 30 and let's work on some stuff and then we'll uh, about 7 30 we'll go get some breakfast so all right and so I went over there and, and we worked on some things and then we went over to, there was an IHOP right across the parking lot. <clears throat> and um, this is probably BJ's most memorable <laughs> time being around Mr. Parker also, because we got over to the IHOP. And uh, so we went in and sat down and Mr. Parker, it, he pulls me out of the booth and starts doing techniques on me. And I look at BJ and she is so embarrassed. It's unreal. She's, She's wanting to crawl under the table. And so we would sit back down and we'd discuss that technique and something hit his mind. He'd pull me out, out of the booth and we'd start doing techniques again. Well, the place starts filling up and they bring our breakfast. So I'm, I'm, when I'm eating, I'm taking very little small bites and chewing them real quick because I never know when Mr. Parker's going to pull me out of that booth and do something on me. And so we finally get through breakfast and now this IHOP is full of people. And, uh, you know, again, Mr. Parker, uh, you know, that was just him. If, if you know, he, if he wanted to show you something, he didn't care where he's at, he was going to show it to you. So we go up to pay out and BJ goes, I'll wait for y'all outside. So she, she just leaves and goes out to the parking lot. So we're standing in the line up there to pay out and Mr. Parker's turning around and doing different things and techniques on me. And so they had this, Come in into the IHOP, <clears throat> they've got a hallway there. And before it actually goes in where, you know, someone greets you and takes you to sit down in a restaurant and stuff like that. Well, this thing is packed all the way out to the parking lot. People are all over the sidewalk waiting to get in. And so we start walking out of this hallway and Mr. Parker turns around and he starts doing another technique on me. And so this continues all the way out. And then we get out in the parking lot and we're out in the parking lot for almost an hour doing techniques and stuff. And so he said, well, he said, uh, he saw it. He said, you know, I got, I've got to go. He said, before I go, he said, I got some material I want to give you up in my room. Okay. So, and he was staying on the second floor. So we go up there and he's putting the key in the door and I'm standing behind him with my back to the rail and BJ standing to my right. And Mr. Parker turned around and he goes, Mr. Burks. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, do you know what the transition uh, wings of silk is in long three, and I'd already learned to uh, say, you know, Mr. Parker, I really wish you to just explain that to me. And so he came around, he hits me with an elbow shot, and I go over the rail. I go backwards over the rail. He reached over and grabbed me, pulled me back up, came across and hit me with a left palm hand claw, hits me with a right raking back knuckle strike, reverses that. Hits me with a hammer fist going forward, another palm hand claw going forward, and turn around and open the door and walk in the room. And I'm standing there, my heart's doing this, and I look at BJ, and she is just white. 
And she's standing there, her eyes are real big. She goes, oh, my God, he knocked you over that rail. And I said, yeah, but he caught me. Did you see that technique he did? And she crazy. He could have killed you. No, no, he's, he's got control of it. So, but like I say, Mr. Parker, the, the thing about him, uh, you know, he was 24-7 when he's around you. Sure. Uh, to talk about Kempo. And Paul's experienced this. Yeah, let me, let's get, you know, I'm going to do right now, I want to get through as many of these people as quickly as I can. So, Mr. Burks, I appreciate if you could get to that, their response as quickly as you can. I want you to meet a few of the people that are very important to the Kempo community. One of them is Wes Hibben. His father is Gil Hibben. Wes, are you there? I'm going to unmute you right now, sir. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Please say hello to Tommy Burks. Hello, Mr. Burks. Hello, sir. I have not had the opportunity to work out with you at all. But well, hopefully we'll change that in the future. Yes, I haven't been down to Texas, but I would be interested to learn more of your uh, your knife stuff. I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to show you some stuff, sir. Thank you so much there, Wes. Let's get that while we're on the Hibbins anyway. Let's talk to Derek Hibbin. That's uh, Wes's brother, and their father is Gil. Uh, are you there, Darren? Derek. I am. Uh, say hello, Derek. Hello, sir. Mr. Hibbins. It's been uh, very educational and, and nice to hear uh, some of what you had to say, sir. Um, I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, but I would like to. I would uh, really enjoy to uh, swap some information uh, on some, some history and some things that I know. Uh, a lot of the knife stuff, um, a lot of people don't know, um, actually was formulated and came from my father, Gil Hibben, when he did his black belt thesis in 66, it was about 68 was when he did it. And uh, he really, really introduced uh, the extension of the, of the knife into, into the Kempo world um, with not only creating the Parker knife, but several different versions of it. And he was also approached uh, with the, uh, the idea of speak with a knife and, um, in the talks that you had uh, in, in regards to the, the speak with a knife, Mr. Parker and my father had the conversation and my father recalls everyone kind of coming to an agreement that the world wasn't ready yet for what, was, what that material had and using words like filet and all of these different things and that also that it would in fact tarnish the empty hand principles and concepts of the and the integrity of the art of Ed Parker's American Kempo. So um, that being the history that I've grown up and known, um, is is that something that that you feel at the time as you were approached and talked to about it that the world wasn't ready yet? Thank you, Derek. Well, you know. Uh... It probably wasn't, but if you look at it now through social media, it's everywhere. Uh, you know, you, you can get on there and watch people doing uh, knife techniques and stuff like this for a solid week if you want to. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things you, you referred to is uh, the concepts and principles, and one of the things Mr. Parker really emphasized to me, he said, just because you put a weapon in your hand, do not quit doing concepts and principles of American Kempo. He said, that's the biggest thing that I see people do. As soon as they put, their, put a weapon in their hands, they change totally everything that they do. And he said, you know, don't do that. Let's go on and move on to Greg Hildebrand. How are you doing, Greg? You're on with Tommy Burks. Hello, Paul. Hi, Mr. B Hi, Mr. Burks. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, sir. How are you? Uh, I spend a Pretty good. Hey, I appreciate being on this uh, this meeting. I think they're amazing. That you're doing a great job, Mr. Casey. Um, bringing people together, speaking to some of the seniors and super enlightened individuals within our Kempo community. Um, I was I was on Mr. Uh, Knatzer's Zoom, which was very enlightening as as always. And um, I spent a lot of time collaborating and spending uh, time working with Mr. Burks. So. Instead of asking him more questions, because I, I tend to ask him a lot of annoying questions in the past, I, I think I'll spend, I'll, I'll share that, extend my, that time to the other people in the group. 
Thank you, Craig. We appreciate that. I want to get through so everybody has a chance to say a few words while we're here. And Tom, are you there, Tom? I'm going to unmute your microphone. Are, can you hear me, sir? Tom? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, would you play, uh, say hello to uh, Master uh, Burks? I say hello to Mr. Burks a lot because we're very close. Hello, Mr. How are you doing, sir? Thanks, sir. Um, you know, I just like to say to me, it's just how much of an inspiration he is and, and all the stuff that he does, how he keeps true to Mr. Parker and keeps adding on more and more uh, stuff with the knives and stuff also, but staying true to Mr. Parker and giving credit where it's due. And uh, I just appreciate that he always does give credit to Mr. Parker, which they should. Just want to thank him for that. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. We're going to move right on. I'm going to go down to the other end of the spectrum. Hopefully, he's still there. Uh, Zachary Carter, your microphone is unmuted. Do you have a question for Tommy Burks? Uh, no, actually, I just wanted to uh, thank him for uh, taking the time to share all this great history and stuff with uh, Mr. Casey and all of us here. And uh, I just really appreciate it. And I'm glad his health is doing well and look forward to the next time seeing him. Thank you, Mr. Burks. Thank you, sir. Moving right along. Carlito, are you there, sir? I'm, I've just unm unmuted your microphone. Would you say hello to Tommy Burks? Carl yes, yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm here. Uh, 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 thank you uh, very much, uh, Tommy, for uh, giving me the invite. It's, a, it, it's an honor for me to be present here. Um, I'm not a Kempo practitioner. Uh, I, I do know several people that uh, are in the in in the industry, and uh, I, I do Filipino martial arts, and uh, I've had the honor to uh, spend. Uh, 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 several days with Tommy in, in Laredo, Texas. And it was one of the best experiences I ever had. Uh, his yeah, insight into uh, uh, not just Kempo, because uh, I don't know much about, you know, the, uh, uh, Kempo itself, uh, but with uh, his knowledge in, in, in martial arts in general. Uh, and he really had a great uh, grasp of movement and, and watching how he moved and uh, also uh, uh, the, what, what he, uh, the, the insights that, that he was able to see in, in the stuff that I did. And, uh, and I see Jeff right there too. <laughs> so I really had a good time that weekend. But sir, I, I really wanted to make, make a comment. Uh, not so much a question, sir, uh, but uh, you had mentioned uh, how um, uh, what, what, uh, when, when, when uh, you see uh, practitioners of uh, maybe your art, uh, when they transition to uh, holding a weapon in their hand, they change things, you know. And, and they forget the concepts that, that they learn and, and, and just the simple fact that they have a, an, another object in their hand as opposed to just the empty hand. And, uh, and, and you know, I find that very common. Uh, when I teach, I look at people uh, when they're from a different style or system, uh, I, I want to get a, a, an idea of how they move. Uh, I, I look at their forms, uh, how they do certain techniques, and then I base my teaching on that because it, it works better. Why in the world would you want to change the way you move when you already have uh, the, something that works? Uh, let's just put a knife in there and, and figure out how, how, how best to approach that. And uh, so I really like that concept, sir. Thank and you so much, Carlito. Thanks, sir. Let's go on to a few other people. Israel, are you there? Sir, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, you're on with Tommy Burks. <laughs> All right, Richard thank you. Burks. Hello, Master Burks. What's uh, your question, sir? Uh, well, I have a comment. Uh, and I am very, very honored to, I haven't known Mr. Burks very long. I know he teaches at our camp every year since 2015. Uh, anyway, I'm Kaji Kimbo. Uh, studied Kimbo way back in the early 80s, but um, um, yeah, due, due to moving and, and, uh, and everything else, I went to Kaji Kimbo and I've been and catch him up for a long time. Anyway, so I met Mr. Mr. Burks, and he has given us the honor of teaching at our seminar every year. Uh, reminds me of my teacher, Grandmaster Richard Peralta. Uh, thinks a lot like him. Uh, I do have one question, and again, and this is a, a pretty tough one. What uh, What is your most frustrating moment in Kimbo? Thank you, Israel. Tommy, what's your response for that? Are you there? I lost you. Hold on. Let's make sure we got you. Let's see what we got here. 
hang in there. We've got a technical issue. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, try again. I think you should be fine now. Check your check your uh, mute. Is it muted? You should be open. There we go. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, my probably most frustrating moment is dealing with the health issues I've had um, over the years. I know in, in 2015, uh, when I taught, no, it was 2016, when I taught over at y'all's event in Fort Worth, uh, two weeks prior to that, I had a hip replacement. And so, so you know, everybody was saying, well, you know, you can't, you can't go over and teach. And I said, why not? And they said, we just had that hip put in. Well, you know, we'll, we'll make it work. And, and we did. And so, uh, again, so, I, you know, to me, you know, other than that, the, the probably the, the next most frustrating thing I did, ever did in Kempo was learn short form one. And I don't know why, but that form eat me up. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't have a clue why, but I mean, me trying to learn short form one was like a fish out of water. I mean, you know, I, I was, wasn't uh, swimming upstream and I wasn't swimming downstream. I was laying on the bank somewhere flopping all over the place. So, but, but after that, everything just started falling in place. And, and like I say, it's, it's just a system that uh, to me is unbelievable. And again, I, I'm nothing but a student. Uh, you know, uh, I'll always be a student and I'm always trying to improve. Let's go on to asking uh, Darren Fanzler. Are you there, Darren? Yes, I'm here. Say hello to Tommy Burks. Hey, Mr. Burks, how are you doing? Good. Good. Hey, um, so I wanted to go back and cover something um, about the grappling because I, I remember one time in one night in class we were going over some grappling and uh, it's not that we don't do it, we do, but our philosophy, I believe, is different. It's, it's we want to learn enough to get back up because we want to be up on the ground, right? Yep. Isn't that what I got from that class? Yep. All right, so I just wanted to see if you wanted to expound on that. Thank you, Darren, for the question. I, I'm sorry. About that real quick. You know, I asked, I asked Mr. Parker one time, you know, his opinion of the Gracies. And he said, you know, they're some of the best at what they do I've ever seen. But he goes, why would you want to be on the ground? And I said, well, I don't. It's, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm crippled up and it's hard for me to get back up. <laughs> Let's move on right here. Let's go to uh, somebody in Texas because they call themselves from Texas. Coach Clay Lonis, you're on with Master Burks. Mr. Burks, how are you, sir? I'm doing good, sir. How are you, Mr. Giannis? I'm good. I'm good. Dad, thanks for that. Thanks for the name pronunciation. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, you know, mine's more of a statement and uh, just want to say Mr. Mr. Vickers was my introduction to uh, Mr. Burks and uh, Mr. Vickers knows that he's one of the very few martial artists that I actually trust when it comes to an opinion on somebody else. In fact, I, uh, I got to train with him and uh, after my first class, I rant and raved on Mr. Vick's, uh, Mr. Vickers' uh, Facebook Messenger about how much I learned about just neutral bow in my first class for an hour and a half straight. And it was actually more than I had learned um, about in my entire time in training and other instructors in Kempo. I've been training, uh, training different martial arts since I was four, and I'm 45 now. But uh, I was just uh, so appreciative of, of the stuff that Mr. Burks was able to show me in an hour and a half that I'd never even heard before. But uh, that and how much I appreciate the, the fact that – and Mr. Burks actually just said it. He's, he is always a student. He, I teach Israeli self-defense, and uh, he found that out and, and uh, wanted to know what uh, Israeli self-defense had to offer when it comes to knife or gun or whatever else, and actually let me uh, teach a couple techniques in class. And uh, just phenomenal in his response on the stuff that he's seen that I hadn't even seen about those techniques before. So very, uh, very thankful to, to, uh, to have been able to train some thus far. Thank you, sir, for uh, – Mr. Burks, why don't you respond to that, and then I'm going to open up all the microphones that they can say one last comment to you before we close out this session. So any thoughts on what uh, the coach said? You know, like I say, we've, I, you know, I, I'm not against grappling. Uh, again, I don't want to be on the ground. As a police officer, I was wearing 40 to 50 pounds of equipment. 
you know, with a gun belt, everything that's on that gun belt, a bulletproof vest, which, which hampers your movement, etc. So the last place that I wanted to be was with a subject rolling around on the ground, especially if there's other people there. Now, again, you know, my approach to uh, resting people was go up there and treat them the way I wanted them to treat me. And like I say, 99% of the time, people were ready to go to jail with you. I, I had a correction officer ask me one time, he goes, why do people thank you for bringing them to jail? And I said, Charles, people don't thank me for bringing them to jail. I said, people thank me for treating them like a human being. And, you know, no matter if they're the biggest dirt bag in the world, I still treat them like a human being. Now, Mr. Casey, what I think I seen Dennis Kanatcher on there a while ago. Would, would you go ahead and let me uh, say hi to him real quick? Yeah, right. let me, I'm going to open it up. Is, uh, are you on there, uh, Mr. Kanatcher? Hello? Let's see if I can get him to answer. Yeah. He may be disappearing. We'll see what happens right now. Let's see. Well, he'll be, if that's the case, let's see. Let's see if I got every, ah, Steve Orsino is here. So maybe Mr. Orsino might want to say something very quickly before yeah. he's always responded to every one of these. So go ahead. Are you there? Did I, are you unmuted? Are you unmuted? I am. Am I? There you go. Steve Orsino from Sacramento. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate your time, taking your time out to share your experiences. I, it's good to hear hear about that. And uh, of course, I seen uh, when I seen Car Carlito, um, I thought, wait a minute, wait, there's an Escrima guy here. What's up with that? <laughs> but uh, uh, Carlito, I don't, you, we haven't really talked that much, but uh, I, I trained with George De Leon in SLD, so yeah, I know you know each other. So, uh, but yeah, I. Uh, I, I appreciate these talks, Paul, and uh, uh, Tommy, just carry on and keep training. That's all we can do, right? Thank you, brother. Well, I'm going to put it on everybody now so that we can have uh, a, uh, the view of all our friends here. I'm going to unpin you, making sure everybody is speaking. Let's get it up there. Uh, and one more thing. So now everybody is up. Hey, can you all see each other? I hope so. I want to say thank you very much. Uh, for all those that uh, that are here today. Again, this is a continuing educational video series. We ask everybody to participate, to bring something to the table. That's what we are an extended family of Campo. We are grateful for the participants. We're very thankful that our special guests take time out of their busy schedule. I know Mr. Uh, Burks is a very busy man and I thank you, sir, uh, from the Campo Karate Hall of Fame and we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Any last comments, sir, before everybody says goodbye? Well, thank you, Paul. And, and again, like you said, you know, Mr. Parker and his constitution want us all to come together and work together, help each other. And that's what we need to do. Uh, you know, and to me, uh, my door's open. Uh, I help people as much as I can. And again, very fortunately to be personally involved with several of the people that's it's on here today, you know, with Mr. Graves, et cetera. And again, it's, uh, I learned from everybody and that's, that's what we need to look at it. We, we should always look at, we're a student. And well, thank you very much. And with that, no further to be said, we look forward to seeing you folks next week. We'll have some more, our special guest, uh, and you're always welcome to ask a question again. Thank you, Bert Israel, uh, coach clay. What a great name, coach clay. I love it. Kevin, Steve, Greg, Derek, Jeff, Carlito, you should be in a movie. <laughs> Tom, Wes, Darren, and Zach. So thank you so much from the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. Have a great Sunday. Thanks. Bye, everyone.